and gave the people outside the South their first knowledge, we're going to visit Uncle Remus and listen to one of his stories. Imagine walking through the gates of Disneyland, a place where dreams come alive, and stopping for pancakes at Aunt Jemima's kitchen. Or picture yourself humming a cheerful minstrel tune as you wait in line for Splash Mountain. In this video, we will dive deep into the times Disney got the South wrong and what they did to fix it. Aunt Jemima's Kitchen. Let's journey back to 1955, the birth of Disneyland, a new dawn of imagination for families across the nation. But even in this land of wonder, the shadows of the past lingered. Guests of the park could enjoy Aunt Jemima's pancakes and even see Aunt Jemima walking around the park. And while Aunt Jemima was never a Disney character, impersonators greeted guests and sang to them at the park. Well, of course, this must have caused controversy, right? Not exactly. Back then, and to many of the unsuspecting families who attended Disneyland, Aunt Jemima was a harmless, idealized figure of a caregiver. Amiable, loyal, maternal, non-threatening, obedient, and submissive. At least, that was a stereotype. Today, it's obvious. You see, Aunt Jemima was always rooted in the mammy stereotype, and minstrel shows. Even the name Aunt Jemima comes from a song, Old Aunt Jemima. Which was a staple of the minstrel circuit. Aunt Jemima's Pancake House closed in 1970 at Disneyland, but you can still see the original building in the River Bell Terrace located at Disneyland. Let's keep that in mind as we move to our next sample of how Disney got the South wrong. Zippity Doodah. This 1945 song was the unofficial theme song of Disney parks for over 60 years. In fact, the song was only removed from daily parades at both parks in 2021. What many don't realize is that Zippity Doodah is inspired by Zip Coon, a tune from 1820s that was used in minstrel shows, a form of entertainment that thrived on degrading caricatures of black Americans. These minstrel shows were cultural forces, shaping perceptions of race and reinforcing harmful stereotypes. The very melody that we associated with Zippity Duda was originally used to mock and belittle. The lyrics, my oh my, what a wonderful day, take on a different tone when you consider their origins. Is it possible to separate the melody from its roots? Or are we unwillingly participating in the legacy of racial stereotyping? How about you be the judge? Let's take a look at the lyrics of Zippity Duda and the lyrics of Zip Coon. If you look at the chorus of Zip Coon, the chorus goes, Oh, zip a doon doon doon, zip a doon day, oh, zip a doon doon doon, zip a doon day. And how does zippity doo da go? Zippity doo da, zippity a, my oh my, what a wonderful day. Do you think there's similarities? Next up is Song of the South. This Disney-fied retelling of Br'er Rabbit folktales was released when Hollywood frequently romanticized the Old South, the sanitized view of post-Civil War life, one where everyone was happy and content even if reality was far different. We talk about this in our Br'er Rabbit video, but a quick recap. And hi, <laughs> What if I told you that Br'er Rabbit tales were actually slave narratives about subverting the power structure on the plantation. That's not a myth. And so for Disney to take those folk tales from Joel Chandler Harris, which was generated during the height of the Lost Cause narrative, was bound to create a situation where the Brer Rabbit tales would lose a lot of their meaning. Now, this is a whole other conversation. The Disneyfication of a folk tale will usually remove some of its darker corners. So. It can't even be said that they were intentionally targeting Br'er Rabbit. Now, even though Song of the South was released multiple times and generated income, it would find another life in 1990 with the release of our number five time, the Disney Got the South Wrong, Splash Mountain. The animatronic ride of Br'er Rabbit appears in Disney World, Disneyland, and Tokyo Disney. Here, Br'er Rabbit returns retold on Song of the South. Now, by the 90s, there was an awareness that Br'er Rabbit's tales held a lot more depth than Disney initially captured. And while there is nothing inherently wrong with the ride, it was common for minstrel songs to play in the queue, specifically in Walt Disney World, as guests waited to board the ride. But you may ask, 
The South had minstrel shows, but since it's Disney, the words weren't present and the tune lived on. And remember, this is the same ride we gave us hippity doo -dah. What was never captured by Disney was the very subversive nature of these Br'er Rabbit tales. Disney was not equipped to tell the perspective of Br'er Rabbit because they have to tackle difficult issues. That's not what we go to Disney for. It. You don't watch the movies to get hard-hitting lessons. You get an opportunity to escape. And if you're still wondering, throughout this video, we've talked about how Disney has sold one thing. But with the close of Splash Mountain is Tiana's Bayou Adventure. And while this is exciting, it deserves its own video of how Disney engages with the South. Now, our last item that Disney got wrong and is trying to correct is Tom Sawyer Island. And while some people may feel this is a tad bit too far, Tom Sawyer Island at Disneyland, a place where the adventurous spirit of Mark Twain's beloved characters comes alive, when Tom Sawyer Island opened in 1956, it was more than just an attraction. It was an homage to Disney's own childhood. Walt wanted visitors to experience the color, romance, and drama of frontier America, as he put it. And for many years, that's exactly what guests did, blissfully unaware of the narratives that were left untold. Walt Disney himself was a great admirer of Mark Twain, and like many Americans of his time, Disney was enchanted by Twain's tale of Huck Finn and Tom Sawyer, stories that painted a vivid picture of the South, stories that captured the imagination, but also reflected a very specific perspective. Now, both Walt Disney and Mark Twain were Missourians for parts of their life, but Mark Twain, like Joel Chandler Harris, was a Southern man whose writing shaped the minds of countless readers around the world, offering a version of the South that many embraced without question. But here's the twist. Whose South are we truly seeing? We must ask ourselves, what stories were missing from this nostalgic vision of Tom Sawyer's island? The stories of black Americans, like Jim and Huckleberry Finn, whose portrayal has been the subject of countless debates due to Twain's use of the N-word and the complex, often painful history it represents. And what about the Native Americans who were systemically displaced to make way for the frontier that Walt celebrated? The island's original Fort Wilderness featured Andrew Jackson, a figure whose legacy is marked by the brutal removal of Native American tribes. And it wasn't until 2003 that Andrew Jackson's statue was quietly removed from the attraction, a subtle change that speaks volumes about how our collective memory evolves. How should we feel about Tom Sawyer Island today? Well, in August 2024, Disney announced they would remove both Tom Sawyer Island and the Rivers of America and the Mark Twain boat to make way for new attractions. To me, people clamoring that they aren't honoring Walt's vision. What do you think? Can changes be made to Disney World and Disney Parks that still honor Walt Disney's original vision and reflect our current time? While it's true that the island reflects Disney's upbringing and the values he cherished, it also serves as a mirror to our changing perspectives. Ultimately, this comes down to what is a version of the South Disney wants to capture. Throughout this video, we've talked about how Disney has sold one thing. Disney said, Disneyland will never be completed. But he also said, I hope we never lose some of the things of the past. But who's past? If you're not sure what Disney's selling, well, this thing is precious. It's hard to name. You usually know it when you feel it and it's something we all have experienced from time to time. It's homesickness. Okay, it's actually nostalgia. Disney sells nostalgia. If you don't remember a nostalgia from your fifth grade English, the dictionary describes it as a term for people irrationally longing for their native land. Irrational, now that's an interesting word choice. But in this case, the nostalgia that Disney sell is the one from our childhood. And Disney wanted to maintain things from his childhood. And I think many People who are upset about the changes happening in Disney part are also upset about what they think they're losing from their childhood. But as values and perspectives change, so too does our ability to get back to our childhood. So thanks for watching. Until next time, this is the Legacy of Folktales, where we take folktales to look at history and provide context to our modern world. Leave us a thought. Is it true that Disney messed up the South? Let us know what you think in the comment section. And don't forget to subscribe for more videos like this. It helps our small channel grow. And if you want to dig even deeper, watch our next video about the plantation hidden in plain sight in Disneyland. I right, signing out.